Welcome to LMU special lecture series. My name is Yong Sun Pag. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, the benefactor of the Center for Asian Business and sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education and International Relations and Asian Pacific Student Services. Let me recognize my colleagues behind, helping me behind the scene. Ms. Nola Wanta, the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy, Dr. Marky Jones, Assistant Director of the Center, and Mrs. Jennifer Tyler, Administrative Coordinator. Nola will help me with a Q&A session later. Before we start the program, I'd like to ask Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of the College of Business Administration, to say a few words to welcome everyone. Dr. Smith? It's my pleasure on behalf of the College of Business at LMU to welcome our speaker and all of you for tonight's webinar. Scholar and foreign policy expert, Dr. Jonathan Pollack, I was so excited that he was going to be joining us when the Saib and CAB announced that we would be hosting one of the world's leading scholars on China and international strategy. Never has there been a more critical time in our history where our success as a global community to come together to survive the pandemic, restore economic prosperity, and ensure sustainability on so many factors from food security to economic opportunities to peace and justice many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we are so dependent upon countries coming together, working together and making an impact. Historically, our relationship with China has ranged from adversarial to more normalized relationships and now where we find ourselves at this particular juncture in time. As I reflect on our goal as educators in a business school, I recognize how important it is to have deep level understanding of how history, politics and economics can impact the relationships between nations. Our mission in the CBA to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community calls upon all of us to understand the larger global picture and develop an appreciation for the topic this evening, addressing the crisis of US-China relations and its impact. All of us tonight have a role to play in advancing knowledge, developing ethical leaders in the college and learning how we all can be a force for good as business leaders and more importantly, as global citizens. My hope is that we'll take this next hour to really learn from Professor Pollack as we educate ourselves and we work across disciplines, across boundaries and across borders to make the planet a more secure global community. And that begins with a deep dive into crisis in US and China relations. Dr. Pollack, welcome and thank you for being here. Okay, thank you, Dale, uh, for your nice, uh, warm welcome remarks. We prepared this webinar to help the audience better understand the US-China relations that have contributed to deteriorate, particularly since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you well know, for the past two years, US-China trade war has escalated as the U.S. imposes tariffs on Chinese products and China retaliated in kind, although it appears to subside with the conclusion of the phase one trade deal signed last January. Other disputes over technology and data security issues have already involved the leading Chinese companies such as Huawei, ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, and Tencent who owns WeChat. I'm sure that um, many of you are using these well, uh, the apps. These Chinese uh, the Chinese government was also upset with the US government response to the political turmoil in Hong Kong, as well as to the coronavirus pandemic, to the responses of coronavirus uh, pandemic. In the midst of rising tensions with China, the US ambassador to China will step down next month. So from military to technology, and the economy to political influence, the conflict between the two superpowers is intensifying in just about every realm of human life. Some people are even start calling it a new Cold War. So today we are fortunate to have an expert who can explain the background and the implications of all these issues in a broad context of US-China 
relations from political, economic, and business perspectives. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Pollock. Dr. Pollock is a non-resident senior fellow in the John Thornton China Center and Center for East Asia Policy at the Brookings Institution. Prior to joining Brookings in 2010, he was a professor of Asian and Pacific Studies and chairman of the Strategic Research Department at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. He previously worked at the Rand Corporation, where he served in various positions, including chairman of the Political Science Department, corporate research manager for international policy. He received his PhD in political science from University of Washington, and he was a post doctoral research fellow at Harvard University. Dr. Pollack, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to LMD community out of your very busy schedule. As we agreed, I'd like to ask you to present first your own analysis of the current US-China relations from political, military, and academic perspectives so that the audience are educated about the key issues involving the two countries at this moment. Then I'll ask you a few questions following your presentation before we start a Q&A session with the audience. Audience, please click on the questions Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to submit questions at the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a brief survey. Okay, Dr. Pollock. Thanks uh, both to Dale Smith and uh, Yongsun Park. Park for those uh, warm introductory remarks. I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today to the Center for uh, International Business Education at LMU uh, and offer some of my views on the current US-China relationship and where things might be headed. This is obviously a very complex subject and it's not possible in one lecture to provide a comprehensive assessment but I'll try to concentrate on what I believe are some of the major factors that help explain the present situation and the potential costs and risks if current trends persist. What's very striking to me in considering uh, the state of the relationship is uh, the, the profound decline. Uh, if there's one thing on which the United States and China seem pretty much in agreement, is that the relationship has reached the lowest point in a half century. Uh, what's striking about that decline, and it's evident in attitudes in government, it's attitude in attitudes in um, a very comprehensive uh, review by the Pew Research Center on views in the United States uh, towards China, is all of this, has ha this decline, this deterioration, has happened without a precipitating event. Uh, there's been no 9-11, no global financial crisis, no North Korea invading South Korea. Uh, it's almost happened on its own, although some might focus on COVID, but frankly, the pandemic, there are many trends that preceded. So the question to ask is, how have we gotten here? Uh, and what is it specifically uh, that uh, is um, driving things in a negative direction? And of course, COVID uh, is on top of all of this. For many years uh, since the US and China normalized relations uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the late 1970s, the presumption was that economic relations in particular could be considered the primary stabilizing force in US-China relations. But these have been severely disrupted by a trade war and by Ch US accusations of Chinese technology theft, um, unwarranted subsidies for Chinese industries, predatory trade practices, and a host of other issues that the Trump administration, in the Trump administration's view, uh, prevent an equitable economic competition between the United States and China. But for President Trump personally, these issues begin with one fundamental issue and that is simply the balance or imbalance of trade between the United States and China. This is a longstanding obsession of President Trump's. It dates at least 
from his very harsh attacks on Japan for its trading practices of more than 30 years ago, but now China is the primary target for his critique. Um, my view, though, is that the president's obsession with trade balances gets it all wrong. Uh, there are, of course, both legitimate and illegitimate questions to consider with reference to how the balance of trade works. But uh, in my view, um, his limited understanding, to be frank, with how the international economy operates uh, has served as an enormous um, trigger to so much of what we have seen um, since. Um, in March of 2018, uh, using the Section 301 provisions under the Trade Act of 1974, uh, Mr. Trump uh, began to impose tariffs, additional tariffs on China in a variety of areas. Um, but very frankly, tariffs don't work. Uh, Mr. Trump said that he thinks it's easy to win a trade war. It's not. Um, and that the trade deficits between the United States and China not only reflect for a time China's lower level of development, um, its comparative advantage uh, in uh, exporting a whole variety of products, but it also reflects much more fundamentally um, the imbalance, the acute imbalance in the United States between savings and investment and the resulting effects on capital flows. Um, it's really not so much a question of, of uh, issues of currency manipulation and the like, but it is uh, much more a question of the basis on which the United States has been more than willing until now uh, to engage in this very, very, if you will, unequal uh, trade relationship. Uh, ironically, and uh, uh, Sun already alluded to the phase one trade agreement uh, that was signed in January, uh, that agreement has not reduced the trade deficit between the United States and China. Some of that may be related to the pandemic, uh, but uh, at this point, the overall trade deficit that the United States incurs is at its greatest level since 2008. And there is a widening gap between exports and imports with China. Ironically, uh, as China has made, and we've seen uh, very interesting data on this, even the last several days, as China has made a much more rapid return to economic growth, not on a scale of what China had in the past, but the Chinese economy is recovering from the pandemic much more quickly than many other economies. Uh, and more than this, um, it is, uh, much of this is export led growth from uh, China, uh, on China's behalf to other countries that are not producing as much. So, um, Beyond this, even if we look at tariffs and Mr. Trump's understanding of tariffs, uh, tariffs are a tax. Uh, they punish American companies. They punish American consumers. Uh, they punish American exporters to China, um, all of which has been wrapped up as a primary growth market uh, for the United States over the past decade or more. Uh, Nonetheless, with very few exceptions, uh, Mr. Trump and his principal economic advisors um, follow mercantilist beliefs. They are economic nationalists and resent or even oppose outright uh, the impact of globalization on trade. Um, uh, and this includes then their walking away from a number of multilateral agreements intended to deepen uh, globalization as a phenomenon. It's important though to note here, there's a political aspect to all of this. When President Trump was elected uh, in 2016, um, it derived very, very heavily from anti-globalization sentiment, uh, evident particularly in states in the industrial Midwest. Those were the states that got him to the White House. And it's in those states where there had been a major um, lots of factory closures and the like, um, as American industries migrated uh, elsewhere, not only to China, but heavily to China. 
Uh, and it was precisely that kind of a um, phenomenon that the president used very, very much for his own political advantage at the time. But the deepening disputes between the United States and China go well past trade. Um, and this is more what I would like to get into. Um, President Trump has, in effect, deputized Secretary of State Pompeo to lead the charge. Uh, the Trump administration now follows what it calls a, quote, all of government approach to China, ranging across economics, technology, human rights, uh, China's um, severe infringement on autonomy in Hong Kong, oppression of Uyghur ethnic minority in Xinjiang, and so forth, and pressures on Taiwan. Now, many of these issues uh, offend uh, core American values and have triggered widespread U.S. denunciations of China and the imposition of sanctions uh, and additional limitations. It's a very, very long grievance list, and we don't have time today to go through all of it, although perhaps these issues might arise in the Q&A. But um, it has led China to accuse the United States of infringing on Chinese sovereignty and on blocking China's own continued economic advancement uh, in, in global politics and economics. China, in effect, has become the all-purpose punching bag in American politics, especially among Republicans, but few, if any, in either party uh, at this point want to appear accommodating to China. So there's a sort of, because less you appear in a, in a kind of a soft on China mode. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Trump administration is trying to mobilize a global coalition opposed to China and opposed to uh, acceptance of a range of Chinese higher tech products, uh, Huawei, which if we have time, I'll talk about it as a good example, uh, trying to deny China uh, the export possibilities that have made some of their companies uh, global actors. Uh, now, to many, uh, these are the initial salvos in a new Cold War. But whatever this budding conflict may be, it is not akin to what we faced with the Soviet Union. Uh, China is now a fully integrated member of the international economy. Uh, and China, unlike the Soviet Union, is a dual capable power, combining great economic strength, increasing innovation, and a more powerful military and more modern military that is now able for the first time to project Chinese power beyond China's land borders. So these are all big issues, as you could imagine. And it's a question of how we adjust or don't adjust to these realities. Now, Secretary Pompeo, uh, in late October of 2019, uh, gave a speech which offered the fullest statement, state, statement of the administration's China policies. And then he followed it with another speech uh, this past July, delivered at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. He described China as an unequivocal and growing ideological, economic, political, and military threat to the United States and to many of China's neighbors, accusing China of deception, uh, IP theft, coercion against companies for commercial advantage, surveillance of American citizens and companies, uh, and so forth. He also accused the Chinese Communist Party uh, of an underlying commitment to struggle uh, and uh, international domination, all big words. In his speech, however, at the Nixon Library, Pompeo referred to China as quote unquote, communist China, not the People's Republic of China or not simply China, reverting therefore to a label that had been used repeatedly by the United States during the two decades, uh, the 1950s and 1960s, when our two countries did not deal with one another 
at all. Now, you might think of this as symbolic, but I think in a way it was something more than that. It was a signal to China's leaders uh, questioning their legitimacy uh, in power. Uh, and by giving this speech uh, at the Nixon Library, Pompeo was in effect trying to argue that it was Richard Nixon that first sought to open the door to China, and now Pompeo was doing his best to close it. Is that possible? Even realistically imaginable without uh, exacting an enormous cost on both countries and the international system as a whole. So far as I can tell, Mr. Pompeo has never really asked that question. Now, uh, as I noted before, there's a long list of deeply troubling behavior that we can see uh, from China. Uh, but amidst all of this, there has been an um, unparalleled economic advance within Chinese society especially since China entered the WTO in 2001. There are roughly 400 million Chinese who have already joined what to any of us would look like a very comfortable middle-class existence. Millions of Chinese students have gone abroad for higher education, including, uh, of course, close to 400,000 who now study in the United States. Uh, China was able, over this period of time, to overcome the depravity and outright madness and isolation that China endured uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Of course, in all of this, the U.S. notes that it is still a state or party-centered system that inhibits intellectual freedom uh, and that a leadership remains atop the system that is profoundly authoritarian and is intent on inhibiting the legitimate aspirations of many of its citizens uh, in the growing middle class, including through various surveillance mechanisms. Uh, though I would note uh, here, ironically, many of the surveillance mechanisms that China uses uh, were also of critical importance in clamping down on the coronavirus when it hit. Um, you, you can do both good and bad things in effect with these surveillance techniques. Um, China also was never pretending to be a liberal democracy. And there's a legitimate question to ask whether we, uh, we are applying a, a quote unquote good behavior test to China that we fail to apply to many others uh, who have um, not provoked comparable ire and outrage uh, that China has for the Trump uh, administration. Um, if we examine, however, the Pew data that I mentioned before, the, event, the, the, the numbers are extraordinary. Uh, as recently as 2017, 47% um, of the adult population of the United States had a favorable, an unfavorable view of China that number now is 73%. So in some measure, China has become kind of a, of, a, of a political football. Many are holding it to blame for the coronavirus. Um, it is true that the origins of the virus were either in China or perhaps in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, but uh, the more we learn, the more we know uh, that it was a very, very different kind of virus. Initially, local officials tried to suppress knowledge of it. Uh, when the knowledge emanated up to Beijing, uh, the wheels were set in motion, but the disease was already beginning to spread. In all of this, of course, China has pushed back against the accusations being made against it, sometimes harshly, but often much more temperately. Uh, it insists it does not want to displace the United States as the world's most powerful and influential state. And leading Chinese officials over the last few weeks have reaffirmed their desire for a mutually beneficial uh, political and economic relationship with the United States. It's doubtful in my view that anyone in the Trump administration believes this. But it may be part of a 
buying time strategy that China is employing, hoping to outweigh the Trump presidency in the hopes of resuming a much more stable and cooperative relationship uh, with the United States under um, a Biden administration, assuming that Joe Biden wins the election. Um, but actions of the sort that have been undertaken in politics and diplomacy and in economic separation are never cost-free. Um, the, in China and elsewhere, we see moves toward a much more diversified relationship with the United States, uh, a hedging strategy, if you will, uh, on the premise that the prevailing hostility directed at China now in the Trump administration might be more lasting than people realize, no matter who is elected the next president. Um, now, within China, many believe that the United States seeks to deny China its rightful place as a fully arrived major power in the decades to come. Uh, and that some would go farther and insist that the United States is intent on overthrowing the existing, that China is intent on overthrowing the existing global order and displacing the United States from the West Pacific. But as I see it, we know from our past history that threat-driven rationales and arguments have a self-fulfilling, self-generating quality of their own, often uh, advancing the narrow bureaucratic and political interests of particular constituencies. All of these developments, I believe, reflect a deepening anxiety or even outright fear or even, even paranoia that China will soon supplant and displace the United States as the world's leading economic and technological power, uh, and including, including the proposal of an alternative framework of global governance. Uh, I'm skeptical of a lot of this, and if we have time, we can get into reasons, but that doesn't make it any less uh, evident in those who voice these opinions. Um, most recently, of course, we have seen uh, the controversies involving uh, China's very, very popular, very, very successful made in China um, social media applications, specifically TikTok and WeChat, uh, in an extraordinary um, move by President Trump. In August, he insisted that TikTok be sold to an American company. Uh, he's been a little more ambiguous about WeChat. Uh, and in effect, deny TikTok, which is wildly popular in the United States, uh, to continue to operate uh, on its own. Um, the Trump administration, however, argues that it sees malicious uses underlying this growing popularity of, uh, of uh, TikTok in particular. According to Secretary Pompeo, utilizing social media tools leaves massive amounts of personal data vulnerable to exploitation by Chinese intelligence, though both parent companies of TikTok and of WeChat deny these allegations. The U.S. claims that dangers to U.S. national security justify efforts to disconnect Chinese carriers from American telecommunications networks. But few uh, non-government analysts have any way to evaluate these allegations, and the U.S. government has disclosed few things that would really enable us to evaluate them critically. Chinese officials view these pending restraints as part of a larger effort to deny Chinese firms access to the U.S. market, thereby impeding China's continued advance and circumscribing future commercial opportunities. In response, Beijing is threatening at the governmental level through their Ministry of Commerce to block the sale of TikTok's assets um, by withholding approval of Chinese export licenses for sale of what are, after all, Chinese commercial technologies um, uh, to, to the United States or anyone else. Um, so, and they've also 
instruct made new limitations on any export of technologies that can be used for analyzing personal information. So in this highly competitive world of social media and e-commerce, Chinese companies and the Chinese government grasp the turnabout is fair play and they are not without leverage in this process. But these moves reflect an intensifying US-China technological divide uh, with both countries proposing separate models of global digital governance. Uh, the Trump administration has enunciated plans for a so-called clean network and all the measures under the clean network are targeted exclusively at China. And in response, China has unveiled its own proposal for data security based on what it calls cyber sovereignty that would enable individual countries to regulate and control the uses of the internet within their own territories. But the US's threat-driven narrative of China now goes well beyond President Trump's longstanding obsession with trade imbalances. Um, and the investment outlook is even more sobering. Chinese outbound investment to the United States surged to record highs in 2016, but it has since plummeted to 2010 levels. The expectation of a few years ago that increasing integration between the two world's two largest economies would provide much needed ballast for the bilateral relationship does not apply in an, in an administration dominated by economic nationalists hostile to interdependence. In the longer run, the administration seems intent on strategic separation and economic decoupling from China, especially in high technology areas. However, unrealistic that goal seems. This obviously includes Huawei, a leader in telecommunications gear and already well advanced in 5G ambitions. The US is now pressuring virtually all of its closest allies to sever or at least sharply curtail their links with Huawei, which it deems again a major national security threat and commercial challenger. Um, new regulations are now, U.S. regulations now prohibit the sale of a variety of computer chips to Huawei for use in their smartphones, which will deny Huawei the ability to compete once its existing inventory of trip chips, chips is exhausted. But it does provide a powerful impetus for China to devote major resources to the indigenous development of advanced trips. There's also the phenomenon of punitive sanctions uh, for a variety of offenses claimed against China. But it's unclear to me how the administration expects these actions to induce longer term Chinese behavior that would address Chinese grievance, US grievances. Trump and his advisors seem to believe that punitive policies will slow China's advance and that characterizing China as the preeminent threat to the United States will benefit President Trump's reelection prospects. But the administration has given minimal, if any, consideration to the implications of an adversarial relationship with China or to the consequences of an increasingly fractured global economy as China quite likely increasingly goes its own way. So these experiences that China has had with the United States under President Trump have been deeply sobering and to other countries as well. No matter who is elected in November, China will seek to reduce its dependence on the United States and accelerate the development of indigenous technologies to protect the country from US unpredictability and hostility. The next administration in my view will need to ponder carefully whether a lasting US-China technology divide will be in anyone's long-term interest. Thank you for your time and attention. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Pollack, uh, for your very comprehensive and insightful analysis of the current status of the US-China relations. You kind of alluded that a lot of what accusations of the uh, Trump's government of cybersecurity and um, trade dispute and et cetera is uh, rather unfounded. So 
you know, we have a lot of questions, almost 20 questions from the audience. So um, I prepared, a, you know, three or four questions, but I'm going to reduce my questions only okay. two before we open up the, uh, to the questions to the mm -hmm. audience. So the first question I'd like to ask you, most people actually that do not know that China is no longer the number one U.S. trading partner. If you look at the trade balance in merchandise transactions last year, it is Mexico and Canada who occupied uh, first and second place respectively, mm -hmm. and China dropped to their third place. Mm -hmm. This indicates the Trump's administration's protectionist measures against China has been working, although you, know, you mentioned that the, it has not really substantially reduced our trade deficit with the country. How likely do you think the Chinese government is to implement what they have promised in the phase one trade agreement signed in January 2020, if the Trump administration keeps uh, taking actions to aggravate the situation? Yeah, uh, I would say two things. Uh, first of all, as I understand it, um, calculations of the trade balance or imbalance do not encompass services trade, which sure, in so the that's case- exactly what I meant, the merchandise transactions. Right, right, right. So uh, um, what I would say here is, of course, uh, uh, for um, President Trump, uh, he regards the phase one agreement as um, vindicating what he sees uh, as a managed trade policy. Uh, and that for that reason alone, and because he doesn't have a lot uh, to, uh, to advertise as his big accomplishments uh, in, in the trade area, um, he is more than likely to sustain the policy. However, everyone who has examined the targets uh, in the January agreement concludes that they were wildly unrealistic. And this is even independent of COVID, so that they are not going to meet those targets. Uh, the question is how much do they fall below those targets? These are the things that matter most to Mr. Trump because he really believes that he can argue that this is the real reason why he gets so angry at China uh, more than anything else. Whereas I think a lot of other people in his administration are looking at other kinds of factors that are much more longer term and don't get wrapped around the axle of exact measurements uh, on trade or trade imbalance. I mean, it's important to note here as well that you know the, the way trade is calculated, uh, let's look at iPhones as a perfect example. Um, sure. The box says designed in California, assembled in China. And that's true. So that when the phone leaves China, it becomes a quote unquote Chinese export. Uh, I don't think most of it would regard it, regard it as a Chinese export, other than the fact that that happens to be where the final assembly occurs. Um, the company uh, that runs this enormous facility in China, Foxconn, is from Taiwan. Uh, the protective glass on the screens of iPhones comes from South Korea. So it's really a product of globalization. Uh, but, you know, for purposes of using this for political ammunition, Trump seems to believe he's got to show a narrowing of the, uh, of the imbalance. And I think that the only way he's really going to get there uh, would be to uh, disrupt as much as possible the kind of trade relations that currently exist make it difficult uh, for um, American companies to operate uh, in China, uh, bring them home, if you will, or that's what he would like to assume he could do. But you still have this fundamental reality of um, uh, even as China moves up the value chain, there's still a lot of production in China that is efficient, high quality, and uh, barring him adding even more tariffs, um, I suspect American consumers will continue uh, to buy. So, um, you know, I, I think in this respect, trade is kind of a, a misleading indicator, um, but it's an indicator that he thinks serves a political purpose for him. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, there was a study already done that uh, if you use the more modernized sort of what the accounting system, as you alluded, uh, in fact, that the, our trade deficit, the size of the trade deficit with China is uh, reduced to half. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. So well, in, f in fact, that's one point I should have made is that 
relative to China's overall trade practices, the U.S. is much less important to China than it once was. Um, not insignificant, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of an, uh, an older story, if you will, that may be less relevant in the future, no matter, no matter what U.S. trade policy might be. Right. In fact, that leads to my next question. The China's that uh, BRI, you know, Belt and Road Initiative, and its trade-based diplomacy probably will make it much easier for China to find export markets in Africa and Middle Eastern countries rather than in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And however, we know that, that there's no silver bullet that will solve this, uh, you know, trade issues. Mm -hmm. But what do you think the best option that China has to meet this challenge from the U.S.? Well, uh, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is much talked about. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's often not exactly what it claims to be, although it has been a source of Chinese funding for a number of infrastructure projects and the like. Uh, my own belief has really been very simple, that if the U.S. objects to these activities that China undertakes, particularly in less developed countries in Central Asia, uh, certainly in Latin America and, and in Africa, um, the U.S. ought to compete. But I, I don't think that the U.S. sees its comparative advantage being in these, in these domains. Um, Japan, interestingly enough, which does participate in major infrastructure projects in many of these areas, uh, actually has moved a little more toward the direction of trying to find ways not to stand opposed to China, but to see if it's possible to collaborate, uh, best practices, transparency, and the like. I mean, the Chinese aren't giving this away. There's a view, of course, this is all part of a grander design of so-called debt trap uh, diplomacy by China to make countries that are in need um, incur indebtedness to China, that China will then be able to take possession of various assets in these countries. Those really boil down to two or three countries that had lots of debts before uh, China entered into these um, transactions with them. Um, and um, there's also just very frankly, the question of how would we wish China to spend its money? Uh, if the government of China has a means to, in effect, determine uh, where resources go. Um, in some ways, I'd rather see it go to infrastructural development and not be so fearful that other governments uh, have no means to protect their own interest under those circumstances. So, uh, it, you know, in a lot of ways, it's, 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 it reflects uh, an argument that, you know, this sort of feeling that we're, we're doomed, you know, China will be able to do this, China will be able to do that. Uh, China is not, you know, without its enormous flaws, enormous limitations. Some of those are manifested in, in its trade arrangements that extend um, through Asia and much, and much beyond. But uh, I think that they recognize that, as the World Bank has made very, very clear repeatedly, the requirements for infrastructural development in Asia over the next 10, 20 years are staggering. Uh, and that has to be, in some sense, a collective effort that is undertaken, even if it may end up being to the advantage of um, particular actors, because I think China does have some comparative advantage there. But one last thing I would say, Yong Sun, is that uh, there's even in some cases resentment in some third world uh, countries when China brings in its own labor force to work on these projects so that it may not be benefiting uh, the country in question uh, quite as much as it should. Uh, so uh, there should be a lot of scrutiny on these projects, but I think it does reflect an enormous pent up demand for exactly these kinds of activities that need to be undertaken. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. So at this point, I'd, uh, I'd like to ask Nola, can you please read some questions we see from the audience, please? Absolutely, and thank you so much to everyone who has submitted their questions. And um, please feel free to use the up, upvote um, option on there. So, you know, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. So our first question is, I sense a general discontent from both sides of, of the political parties in the US. How should Biden approach the current situation if he were to become president 
or would he proceed with similar attitudes, but more subtly? That's an excellent question. And uh, I think we can see from some statements that Biden has made that, number one, uh, he's not ready to give up on globalization. That's very, very clear. But the approach that he is talking about um, seems maybe different from the, let's say, the rosier accounting of uh, globalization that we saw uh, in the Obama administration. Um, he's recognizing and articulates very specifically goals about rebuilding various kinds of industries in the United States so that there is not this uh, extraordinary dependence on supply channel chains from the outside, which has been manifested so much in the COVID crisis. Um, so he, I, I see him as advocating some kind of a modified um, globalization policy, um, but it is not one, I think, that he wants to uh, uh, separate from China, but he's got to find, I believe, um, a different basis on which these relations will be conducted um, heading into uh, his administration, if it is his administration. Um, you know, Biden is a, um, uh, he's a transaction guy. For all the talk about Trump being a businessman, Biden is the one, when he was a senator, you do deals as a senator. He has no discomfort with that at all. And um, more than this, uh, he has a comfort level, I think, in dealing with foreign governments, foreign heads of state, uh, that often uh, those in the Trump administration do not. Uh, they, they hector, they demand, uh, but it's a process where, you know, nobody gives away anything for free. It's got to be conducted seriously. Uh, and, uh, and, and out of this, it's not only a question of trying to rebuild trade and political relations uh, to some extent with China, but it's also a question of doing it with the U.S. allies that uh, Trump has trashed on a repeated basis. Uh, and those countries want relations with the United States, want predictable relations with the United States. And on the basis of having that kind of assurance, they could deal much more comfortably with China. If, if those relations are not there, they are in a real fix and they know it. And that's the kind of nightmare scenario that so many countries don't want to face, which is being forced to choose between the United States and China, which will, after all, be the dominant economic forces in global politics for as far as we can see. Great, thank you. Uh, should we be worried about the India and China border dispute? Uh, this, uh, that's also a very good question. Um, this is a long running uh, dispute. It's about territory, it's about position in some of the most forbidding locations imaginable in the world. Most of this at very, very high altitudes. What is worrisome here is that for the first time in, I don't remember exactly how long, blood has been shed, uh, not in um, copious quantities, but any violence, some of it very hand-to-hand -hand violence, is very, very worrisome. Now, the two sides have now uh, claimed to have come to an agreement that there will be a mutual pullback of forces. In a way, that doesn't surprise me because winter is coming and nobody wants to be out there in the middle of the winter. But, you know, in essence, what this reflects is that there was never a definitive resolution of the borders between China and India. Uh, we're not talking about enormous swaths of territory, but here you have two very proud countries with two very proud leaders, many of whose goals in the two cases are not dissimilar at all. Um, uh, and they have to find a way, uh, if they can, um, to lower the threshold of, of, of tension and of violence. Um, but I would say that these recent activities have been very sobering on both sides. Um, uh, increasing concerns in India that China is prepared to use limited amounts of force, but force nonetheless to its own advantage. Um, even as the Indians have also begun to deploy some uh, increased level of forces, um, some of them trained for mountain warfare and the like, they better be trained for mountain warfare. 
So it's it's something that is is definitely worrisome. I do not think it pre it prefigures a major outbreak of hostilities, but it's just a com a comment yet again that two very proud nationalistic cultures and two very authoritarian leaders. I mean, Modi may be a uh, you know, elected to office, but there's there aren't a lot of democratic bones in his body. There are a lot of authoritarian bones in his body, including oppression against Indian Muslims. So um, uh, I, I think on balance though, this has got to be something for India and China to work out. It is interesting in that regard that whenever there's been a kind of a subsiding of tensions, uh, the party they turn to to help referee this is not the United States, but it's Russia. And that suggests to me yet again, we are moving toward this much more multipolar world where you know, the United States is not gonna be in a position of putting out every fire, of telling people what to do, but dealing with a world where others have their own interests, their own priorities and strategies. Uh, and to some real sense, we will have to accommodate to a lot. Well, if I may just, uh, India has also a very serious uh, dispute over technology with China. Oh, absolutely. So they, they recently yeah. took a very similar actions. Against they did indeed, China. they did indeed, yeah. yeah. Which we, you know, that that that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's uh, that is a very that too is a troubling factor because here again you had a big increase in bilateral trade between China and India, uh, some dealings on technology, but underlying it is um, deep suspicions and differences uh, and rivalry that will dominate. I think a lot of what goes on um, in uh, in international politics, at least among big powers, for a very long time to come. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah, so let me, um, since we were just talking about India, there's a question that came in about how do you see the South China Sea dispute playing out? So the other side, do you see China securing and eventually incorporating it to its borders in the near future? Uh, well, China, of course, um, already claims uh, undisputed sovereignty uh, for many of the islands um, in the South China Sea. I mean, what if, when people hear islands, they probably think of big bodies and all that. Uh, and the Chinese, of course, have built up uh, some of these modest locations, um, in, including with some military hardware, if not active deployment of let's say jet aircraft and the like. Um, but China has the advantage of where it sits. Uh, the US of course is quite apart from the priorities of other uh, neighbors of China, many of whom have claims on these territories as well, or at least some of these territories. Um, but the US sends through frequently so-called freedom of navigation operations. Um, you know, the Chinese are trying to change if you will, facts on the ground or facts in the water. Uh, they have much more military capacity here to influence this uh, compared to some of the others. But they have not, at least to this point, made any effort to dislodge any of the other claimants from pieces of land or sand or rocks that they control. That includes obviously um, Vietnam, uh, very prominently also Indonesia, but it's, it's worrisome that China has refused to accept uh, arbitration rulings uh, take, undertaken by the International Court of Justice. Um, they are disinclined, to say the least, to enter into any kind of active negotiation here. I do not think, though, that this means we are on the, on the cusp of a, major, of a major conflict. That would be very, very worrisome. But if there were to be a major conflict, it's not going to be between China and one of its neighbors. It's going to be China and um, US forces. And I think the avoidance of conflict with China, military conflict with China, uh, will be, should be the preeminent objective of any US administration. Um, and, uh, you know, but accidents happen. And that's one of the things that is worrisome, not by design, not by intention, but either by inadvertence, by error, what have you. So the more that power is deployed there, the more those risks go up. 
Um, the Trump administration, much to my regret, has shown no interest whatsoever in engaging in serious discussions with China about these issues. They're done a little more in, on a military to military basis. And I think that that just simply has to be continued over time. Uh, uh, and then to see whether or not over the longer run, disputes over not only sovereignty, but over who controls which, which fishing rights, which energy rights and so forth, that's gonna have to be a multilateral agreement between China and its neighbors. And it will tell us a lot, frankly, about whether China over the longer run is really willing to come to some kind of reasonable accommodation on these issues. Uh, these are issues of very long standing and the Chinese are not showing a lot of give uh, on the fundamentals, even though they claim they are now very close to agreement on a, what is called a declaration of a code of conduct to um, regulate the military activities of all the claimant states uh, in the South China Sea. We'll see. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we do have Professor Dong Chen who has a question for you. Um, so, Professor Chen, are you available to unmute and ask your question? Wonderful, hello, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, thanks for um, giving us this wonderful webinar. Um, my question is about uh, the impact of U.S.-China relationship on the community of Chinese American and Chinese immigrants. So, as you know, um, the current situation has created a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. and uh, um, <laughs> different uh, views uh, among Chinese American and Chinese immigrants. So, um, what's your take on this situation? That's my question. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, 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 Doug, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm very, very worried about this. We have had far too many episodes in American history where those of different ethnicity are targeted and identified. We know what happened with uh, Japan during the war. Uh, uh, I'm sure to some extent it's happened against Vietnamese, but right now China's got a big target, or Chinese have a big target, and it's very, very worrisome. This is one of the I mean, some people might say, well, there's an unintended consequence. I wouldn't put it that way at all. I think it derives very, very directly from the allegations of um, Chinese being third column elements, fifth column elements in the United States. Um, there have been cases, obviously, of some Chinese scientists who have returned to China and probably were surreptitiously trying to take technology back in, raising a whole set of questions, which frankly, that's one of the things that um, uh, is, enables those who want to sustain these policies to justify them further. But I'm very concerned about attitudes towards students in the United States. Um, it's almost as if um, American universities and the U.S. authorities have no ability to regulate and oversee and make sure that they are all there for legitimate purposes. Um, and I know from conversations with various Chinese students that they worry about this a lot too. This has been such an extraordinary development. Are there so-called bad actors in this process? I'm sure there are some, but that's why you oversee and watch this stuff carefully. But anything that implies that there is a larger design here that um, is intended to steal from the United States and so forth, uh, it just triggers all kinds of associations of the most pernicious and negative sorts and um, will, of course, make very gifted Chinese students uh, to think otherwise about where they go for their higher education. We can see that to some extent already. Uh, by the way, some of this is also directed at Indian scientists in the United States. Um, and frankly, the last thing that Silicon Valley wants to see is the loss of this talent from China and from India upon whom they depend so much. Um, this, those kinds of attitudes, frankly, are often America at its, at its worst. And it, it, except for those where there might be legitimate claims that they've been doing things they shouldn't be doing, I think almost the disproportionate number of those who come to the United States do this for one and one very good reason, and that is to advance their skills, their education, um, 
many of them choose to stay. Uh, you would be a relevant example. Uh, the immigration is the great gift that the United States has always been able to have vis-a-vis -vis the outside world because we have opened our borders to this. But that is at risk right now, and I'm I'm fearful that it could it could get worse if these trends persist. I would hope if Mr. Biden is elected president, he will attach great energy to this um, in rectifying these matters and uh, not letting them uh, go from in, a, in an even worse direction. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'm sorry that we are not able to get to all the questions you posted. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Pollock, thank you so much for your sharing your thoughts and insights with us about this very timely and important topic today. I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program and we'll be back with another program in October. So please stay safe and healthy until then. Before you leave, we would appreciate it if you could complete the short survey at the end of this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, good evening. Okay. And thank you very much.